Bantam Doubleday Dell Audio Publishing presents Island of the Blue Dolphins by Scott O'Dell. I remember the day the Aleut ship came to our island. At first, it seemed like a small shell afloat on the sea. Then it grew larger and was a gull with folded wings. At last, in the rising sun, it became what it really was, a red ship with two red sails. My brother and I had gone to the head of a canyon that winds down to a little harbor, which is called Coral Cove. We had gone to gather roots that grow there in the spring. My brother Ramo was only a little boy half my age, which was 12. He was small for one who had lived so many suns and moons, but quick as a cricket. Also foolish as a cricket when he was excited. For this reason, and because I wanted him to help me gather roots and not go running off, I said nothing about the shell I saw or the gull with folded wings. I went on digging in the brush with my pointed stick as though nothing at all were happening on the sea, even when I knew for sure that the gull was a ship with two red sails. But Ramo's eyes missed little in the world. They were black like a lizard's, and very large, and like the eyes of a lizard, could sometimes look sleepy. This was the time when they saw the most. This was the way they looked now. They were half-closed, like those of a lizard lying on a rock about to flick out its tongue to catch a fly. The sea is smooth, Ramo said. It is a flat stone without any scratches. My brother liked to pretend that one thing was another. The sea is not a stone without scratches, I said. It is water and no waves. To me it is a blue stone, he said. And far away on the edge of it is a small cloud which sits on the stone. Clouds do not sit on stones, on blue ones or black ones or any kind of stones. This one does. Not on the sea, I said. Dolphins sit there and gulls, and cormorants, and otter, and whales too, but not clouds. It is a whale, maybe. Ramo was standing on one foot and then the other, watching the ship coming, which he did not know was a ship because he had never seen one. I had never seen one either, but I knew how they looked, because I had been told. While you gaze at the sea, I said, I dig roots, and it is I who will eat them and you who will not. Ramo began to punch at the earth with his stick, but as the ship came closer, its sails showing red through the morning mist, he kept watching it, acting all the time as if he were not. Have you ever seen a red whale? he asked. Yes, I said, though I never had. Those I have seen are gray. You are very young and have not seen everything that swims in the world. Ramo picked up a root and was about to drop it into the basket. Suddenly, his mouth opened wide and then closed again. A canoe, he cried, a great one, bigger than all of our canoes together, and red. A canoe or a ship, it did not matter to Ramo. In the very next breath, he tossed the root in the air and was gone, crashing through the brush, shouting as he went. I kept on gathering roots. But my hands trembled as I dug in the earth, for I was more excited than my brother. I knew that it was a ship there on the sea and not a big canoe, and that a ship could mean many things. I wanted to drop the stick and run, too, but I went on digging roots because they were needed in the village. By the time I filled the basket, the Aleut ship had sailed around the wide kelp bed that encloses our island and between the two rocks that guard Coral Cove. Word of its coming had already reached the village of Galasat. Carrying their weapons, our men sped along the trail which winds down to the shore. Our women were gathering at the edge of the mesa. As I, I crouched my... there in the toyon bushes, trying not to fall over the cliff, trying to keep myself hidden, and yet to see and hear what went on below me, a boat left the ship. Six men with long oars were rowing. Their faces were broad, and shining dark hair fell over their eyes. When they came closer, I saw that they had bone ornaments thrust through their noses. 
Behind them in the boat stood a tall man with a yellow beard. I had never seen a Russian before, but my father had told me about them, and I wondered, seeing the way he stood with his feet set apart and his fists on his hips, and looked at the little harbor as though it already belonged to him, if he were one of those men from the north whom our people feared. I was certain of it when the boat slid into the shore and he jumped out, shouting as he did so. His voice echoed against the rock walls of the cove. The words were strange, unlike any I had ever heard. Slowly then he spoke in our tongue. I come in peace and wish to parley, he said to the man on the shore. None of them answered, but my father, who was one of those hidden among the rocks, came forward down the sloping beach. He thrust his spear into the sand. I am the chief of Galasat, he said. My name is Chief Chaoig. I was surprised that he gave his real name to a stranger. Everyone in our tribe had two names. The real one, which was secret and was seldom used, and one which was common. For if people use your secret name, it becomes worn out and loses its magic. Thus I was known as Wanapele, which means the girl with the long black hair, though my secret name is Karana. My father's secret name was Chawik. Why he gave it to a stranger, I do not know. The Russian smiled and held up his hand, calling himself Captain Orlov. My father also held up his hand. I could not see his face, but I doubted that he smiled in return. I have come with forty of my men, said the Russian. We come to hunt sea otter. We wish to camp on your island while we are hunting. My father said nothing. He was a tall man, though not so tall as Captain Orlov, and he stood with his bare shoulders thrown back, thinking about what the Russian had said. He was in no hurry to reply, because the Aleuts had come before to hunt otter. That was long in the past, but my father still remembered them. You remember another hunt, Captain Orlov said when my father was silent. I have heard of it too. It was led by Captain Mitriff, who was a fool and is now dead. The trouble arose because you and your tribe did all of the hunting. We hunted, said my father, but the one you call a fool wished us to hunt from one moon to the next, never ceasing. This time you will need to do nothing, Captain Orlov said. My men will hunt and we will divide the catch. One part for you, to be paid in goods, and two parts for us. The parts must be equal, my father said. Captain Orlov gazed off toward the sea. We can talk of that later, when my supplies are safe ashore, he replied. The morning was fair with little wind, yet it was the season of the year when storms could be looked for, so I understood why the Russian wished to move on to our island. It is better to agree now, said my father. Captain Orlov took two long steps away from my father, then turned and faced him. One part to you is fair, since the work is ours, and ours the risk. My father shook his head. The Russian grasped his beard. Since the sea is not yours, why do I have to give you any part? The sea which surrounds the island of the blue dolphins belongs to us, answered my father. He spoke softly as he did when he was angry. From here to the coast of Santa Barbara, twenty leagues away? No, only that which touches the island and where the otter live. Captain Orlov made a sound in his throat. He looked at our men standing on the beach and toward those who had now come from behind the rocks. He looked at my father and shrugged his shoulders. Suddenly he smiled, showing his long teeth. The parts shall be equal, he said. He said more, but I did not hear it, for at that instant, in my great excitement, I moved a small rock, which clattered down the cliff and fell at his feet. Everyone on the beach looked up, 
Silently, I left the toy on bushes and ran without stopping until I reached the mesa. Captain Orlov and his Aleut hunters moved to the island that morning, making many trips from their ship to the beach of Coral Cove. Since the beach was small and almost flooded when the tide was in, he asked if he could camp on higher ground. This my father agreed to. Perhaps I should tell you about our island so you will know how it looks and where our village was and where the Aleuts camped for most of the summer. Our island is two leagues long and one league wide, and if you were standing on one of the hills that rise in the middle of it, you would think that it looked like a fish. Like a dolphin lying on its side, with its tail pointing toward the sunrise, its nose pointing to the sunset, and its fins making reefs and the rocky ledges along the shore. Whether someone did stand there on the low hills in the days when the earth was new and because of its shape, called it the Island of the Blue Dolphins, I do not know. Many dolphins live in our seas, and it may be from them that the name came. But one way or another, this is what the island was called. The first thing you would notice about our island, I think, is the wind. It blows almost every day, sometimes from the northwest and sometimes from the east, once in a long while out of the south. All the winds except the one from the south are strong, and because of them the hills are polished smooth and the trees are small and twisted, even in the canyon that runs down to Coral Cove. The village of Galasat lay east of the hills on a small mesa near Coral Cove and a good spring. About a half league to the north is another spring, and it was there that the Aleuts put up their tents, which were made of skins, and were so low to the earth that the men had to crawl into them on their stomachs. At dusk we could see the glow of their fires. That night my father warned everyone in the village of Galasat against visiting the camp. The Aleuts come from a country far to the north, he said, their ways are not ours, nor is their language. They have come to take order and to give us our share in many goods which they have and which we can use. And this way shall we profit. But we shall not profit if we try to befriend them. They are people who do not understand friendship. They are not those who were here before, but they are people of the same tribe that caused trouble many years ago. My father's words were obeyed. We did not go to the Aleut camp, and they did not come to our village. But this is not to say that we did not know what they did, what they ate and in what way they cooked it, how many otter were killed each day, and other things as well. For someone was always watching from the cliffs while they were hunting, or from the ravine when they were in camp. Ramo, for instance, brought news about Captain Orlov. In the morning when he crawls out of his tent, he sits on a rock and combs until the beard shines like a cormorant's wing, Ramo said. My sister Ulap, who was two years older than I, gathered the most curious news of all. She swore that there was an Aleut girl among the hunters. She is dressed in skins just like the men, Ulap said. But she wears a fur cap, and under the cap she has thick hair that falls to her waist. No one believed Ulap. Everyone laughed at the idea that hunters would bother to bring their wives with them. The Aleuts also watched our village, otherwise they would not have known about the good fortune which befell us soon after they came. It happened in this way. Early spring is a poor season for fishing. The heavy seas and winds of winter drive the fish into deep water where they stay until the weather is settled and where they are hard to catch. During this time, the village eats sparingly, mostly from stores of seeds harvested in autumn. Word of our good fortune came on a stormy afternoon brought by Ulap, who was never idle. She had gone to a ledge on the eastern part of the island, hoping to gather shellfish. She was climbing a cliff on the way home when she heard a loud noise behind her. At first, she did not see what had caused the noise. 
She thought that it was the wind echoing through one of the caves and was about to leave when she noticed silvery shapes on the floor of the cove. The shapes moved and she saw that it was a school of large white bass, each one as big as she was. Pursued by killer whales, which prey upon them when seals are not to be found, the bass had tried to escape by swimming toward shore. But in their terror, they had mistaken the depth of the water and had been tossed onto the rocky ledge. Ulap dropped her basket of shellfish and set out for the village, arriving there so out of breath that she could only point in the direction of the shore. The women were cooking supper, but all of them stopped and gathered around her, waiting for her to speak. A school of white bass, she finally said. Where? Where? everyone asked. On the rocks, a dozen of them, perhaps more than a dozen. Before Ulap had finished speaking, we were running toward the shore, hoping that we would get there in time, that the fish had not flopped back into the sea, or that a chance wave had not washed them away. We came to the cliff and looked down. The school of white bass was still on the ledge, glistening in the sun. But since the tide was high and the biggest waves were already lapping at the fish, there was no time to lose. One by one, we hauled them out of reach of the tide. Then, two women carrying a single fish, for they were all of about the same size and heavy, we lifted them up the cliff and brought them home. There were enough for everyone in our tribe for supper that night and the next. But in the morning, two Aleuts came to the village and asked to speak to my father. You have fish, one of them said. Enough only for my people, my father answered. You have fourteen fish, the Aleuts said. Seven now, because we ate seven. From seven you can spare two. There are forty in your camp, my father replied, and more than that of us. Besides, you have your own fish the dried ones that you brought. We tire of that kind, the Aleut said. He was a short man who only came to my father's shoulders, and he had small eyes like black pebbles and a mouth like the edge of a stone knife. The other Aleut looked very much like him. You are hunters, my father said. Go and hunt your own fish if you are tired of what you are eating now. I have my people to think of. Captain Orlov will hear that you refuse to share the fish. Yes, tell him, my father said, but also why we refuse. The Aleut grunted to his companion, and the two of them stalked off on their short legs across the sand dunes that lay between the village and their camp. We ate the rest of the white bass that night, and there was much rejoicing. But little did we know, as we ate and sang and the older men told stories around the fire, that our good fortune would soon bring trouble to Galisat. ...into Coral Cove, and there on the beach the animals were skinned and fleshed. Two men, who also sharpened the spears, did this work, laboring far into the night by the light of the seaweed fires. In the morning, the beach would be strewn with carcasses, and the waves red with blood. Many of our tribe went to the cliff each night to count the number killed during the day. They counted the dead otter and thought of the beads and other things that each pelt meant. But I never went to the cove, and whenever I saw the hunters with their long spears skimming over the water, I was angry, for these animals were my friends. It was fun to see them playing or sunning themselves among the kelp. It was more fun than the thought of beads to wear around my neck. This I told my father one morning. There are scarcely a dozen left in the beds around Coral Cove, I said. Before the Aleuts came, there were many. <laughs> Many still live in other places around the island, he replied, laughing at my foolishness. When the hunters leave, they'll come back. There will be none left, I said. The hunters will kill them all. This morning they hunt on the south. Next week they move to another place. The ship is filled with pelts. In another week the Aleuts will be ready to go. I was sure that my father thought they would leave soon 
for two days before, he had sent some of our young men to the beach to build a canoe from a log which had drifted in from the sea. There are no trees on the island except the small ones stunted by the wind. When a log came ashore, as happened once in a long time, it was always carried to the village and worked on where a chance wave could not wash it away. That the men were sent to hollow out the log in the cove and to sleep beside it during the night meant that they were there to watch the Aleuts, to give the alarm should Captain Orlov try to sail off without paying us for the otter skins. Everyone was afraid he might, so besides the men in the cove who watched the Aleut ship, others kept watch on the camp. Every hour someone brought news. Ulap said that the Aleut woman spent a whole afternoon cleaning her skin aprons, which she had not done before while she had been there. Early one morning, Ramo said he had just seen Captain Orlov carefully trimming his beard so that it looked the way it did when he first came. The Aleuts who sharpened the long spears stopped this work and gave all their time to skinning the otter which were brought in at dusk. We in the village of Galasat knew that Captain Orlov and his hunters were getting ready to leave the island. Would he pay us for the otter he had slain, or would he try to sneak away in the night? Would our men have to fight for our rightful share? These questions everyone asked while the Aleuts went about their preparations. Everyone except my father, who said nothing, but each night worked on the new spear he was making. The Aleuts left on a sunless day. Out of the north, deep waves rolled down upon the island. They broke against the rocks and roared into the cave, sending up white sprays of water. Before night, a storm would certainly strike. Not long after dawn, the Aleuts took down their skin tents and carried them to the beach. Captain Orlov had not paid my father for the otter he had killed. So when the news came that the hunters had packed their tents, all of our tribe left the village and hurried toward Coral Cove. The men with their weapons went first, and the women followed. The men took the trail that led to the beach, but the women hid themselves among the brush on the cliff. Ulap and I went together far out on the ledge where I had hidden before when the hunters first came. The tide was low, and the rocks and the narrow beach were scattered with bundles of otter pelts. Half of the hunters were on the ship. The rest were wading into the water, tossing the pelts into a boat. The Aleuts laughed while they worked as if they were happy to leave the island. My father was talking to Captain Orlov. I could not hear their words because of the noise the hunters made, but from the way my father shook his head, I knew that he was not pleased. He's angry, Ulap whispered. Not yet, I said. When he's really angry, he pulls his ear. The men who were working on the canoe had stopped and were watching my father and Captain Orlov. The other men of our tribe stood at the foot of the trail. The boat went off to the ship filled with otter. As it reached the ship, Captain Orlov raised his hand and gave a signal. When the boat came back, it held a black chest, which two of the hunters carried to the beach. Captain Orlov raised the lid and pulled out several necklaces. There was little light in the sky, yet the beads sparkled as he turned them this way and that. Beside me, Ulap drew in her breath in excitement, and I could hear cries of delight from the women hidden in the brush. But the cries suddenly ceased as my father shook his head and turned his back on the chest. The Aleuts stood silent. Our men left their places at the foot of the trail and moved forward a few steps and waited, watching my father. One string of beads for one otter pelt is not our bargain, my father said. One string and one iron spearhead, said Captain Orlov, lifting two fingers. The chest does not hold that much, my father answered. There are more chests on the ship, said the Russian. Then bring them to the shore, my father said. You have 105 bales of otter on the ship. There are 15 here in the cove. You will need three more chests of this size. 
Captain Orlov said something to his Aleuts that I could not understand, but its meaning was soon clear. There were many hunters in the cove, and as soon as he spoke, they began to carry the otter pelts to the boat. Beside me, Ulap was scarcely breathing. Do you think that he will give us the other chests? She whispered. I do not trust him. When he gets the pelts to the ship, he may leave. It is possible. The hunters had to pass my father to reach the boat, and when the first one approached him, he stepped in his path. The rest of the pelts must stay here, he said, facing Captain Orlov, until the chests are brought. The Russian drew himself up stiffly and pointed to the clouds that were blowing in toward the island. I load the ship before the storm arrives, he said. Give us the other chests, then I will help you with our canoes, my father replied. Captain Orlov was silent. His gaze moved slowly around the cove. He looked at our men standing on the ledge of rock a dozen paces away. He looked upward toward the cliff and back at my father. Then he spoke to his Aleuts. I do not know what happened first, whether it was my father who raised his hand against the hunter whose path he barred, whether it was this man who stepped forward with a bale of pelts on his back and shoved my father aside. It all happened so quickly that I could not tell one act from the other. But as I jumped to my feet and Ulap screamed and other cries sounded along the cliff, I saw a figure lying on the rocks. It was my father and blood was on his face. Slowly, he got to his feet. With their spears raised, our men rushed down across the ledge. A puff of white smoke came from the deck of the ship. A loud noise echoed against the cliff. Five of our warriors fell and lay quiet. Ulab screamed again and flung a rock into the cove. It fell harmlessly beside Captain Orlov. Rock showered into the cove from many places along the cliff, striking several of the hunters. Then our warriors rushed in upon them and it was hard to tell one from the other. Ulap and I stood on the cliff and watched helplessly, afraid to use the rocks we held lest we injure our own men. The Aleuts had dropped the bales of otter. They drew knives from their belts and as our warriors rushed upon them, the two lines surged back and forth along the beach. Men fell to the sand and rose to fight again. Others fell and did not get up. My father was one of these. For a long time, it seemed that we would win the battle, but Captain Orloff, who had rowed off to the ship when the battle started, returned with more of his Aleuts. Our warriors were forced backward to the cliffs. There were few of them left, yet they fought at the foot of the trail and would not retreat. The wind began to blow. Suddenly, Captain Orlov and his Aleuts turned and ran to the boat. Our men did not pursue them. The hunters reached the ship. The red sails went up, and the ship moved slowly between the two rocks that guard the cove. Once more before it disappeared, a white puff of smoke rose from the deck. As Ulap and I ran along the cliff, a whirring sound like a great bird in flight passed above our heads. The storm struck us as we ran driving rain into our faces. Then other women were running beside us, and their cries were louder than the wind. At the bottom of the trail, we came upon our warriors. Many had fought on the beach. Few had left it, and of these all were wounded. My father lay on the beach, and the waves were already washing over him. Looking at his body, I knew he should not have told Captain Orlov his secret name. And back in our village, all the weeping women and the sad men agreed that this had so weakened him that he had not lived through the fight with the Aleuts and the dishonest Russian. That night was the most terrible time in all the memory of Galasat. When the fateful day had dawned, the tribe numbered 42 men, counting those who were too old to fight. When night came and the women had carried back to the village those who had died on the beach of Coral Cove, there remained only fifteen. Of these, seven were old men. There was no woman who had not lost a father or a husband, a brother or a son. The storm lasted two days, and the third day we buried our dead on the south headland. The Aleuts who had fallen on the beach we burned. 
For many days after that, the village was quiet. People went out only to gather food and came back to eat in silence. Some wished to leave and go in their canoes to the island called Santa Catalina, which lies far off to the east. But others said that there was little water on that island. In the end, a council was held and it was decided to stay at Galasat. The council also chose a new chief to take my father's place. His name was Kimke. He was very old, but he had been a good man in his youth and a good hunter. The night he was chosen to be chief, he called everyone together, saying, Most of those who snared fowl and found fish in the deep water and built canoes are gone. The women, who were never asked to do more than stay at home, cook food, and make clothing, now must take the place of the men and face the dangers which abound beyond the village. There will be grumbling in Galasat because of this. There will be shirkers. These will be punished, for without the help of all, all must perish. Kimke portioned work for each one in the tribe, giving Ulap and me the task of gathering abalones. This shellfish grew on the rocks along the shore and was plentiful. We gathered them at low tide in baskets and carried them to the mesa, where we cut the dark red flesh from the shell and placed it on flat rocks to dry in the sun. Ramo had the task of keeping the abalone safe from the gulls, and especially the wild dogs. Dozens of our animals, which had left the village when their owners had died, joined the wild pack that roamed the island. They soon grew as fierce as the wild ones and only came back to the village to steal food. Each day toward evening, Ulap and I helped Ramo put the abalones in baskets and carry them to the village for safekeeping. During this time, other women were gathering the scarlet apples that grow on the cactus bushes and are called tunas. Fish were caught and many birds were netted. So hard did the women work that we really fared better than before when the hunting was done by the men. Life in the village should have been peaceful, but it was not. The men said that the women had taken the tasks that rightfully were theirs, and now that they had become hunters, the men looked down upon them. There was much trouble over this until Kimke decreed that the work would again be divided. Henceforth, the men would hunt and the women harvest. Since there was already ample food to last through the winter, it no longer mattered who hunted. But this was not the real reason why autumn and winter were unpeaceful in Galasat. Those who had died at Coral Cove were still with us. Everywhere we went on the island or on the sea, whether we were fishing or eating or sitting by the fires at night, they were with us. We all remembered someone, and I remembered my father, so tall and strong and kind. A few years ago, my mother had died, and since then, Ulap and I had tried to do the tasks she had done. Ulap even more than I, being older. Now that my father was gone, it was not easy to look after Ramo, who was always into some mischief. It was the same in the other houses of Galasat, but more than the burdens which had fallen upon us all, it was the memory of those who had gone that burdened our hearts. After food had been stored in autumn and the baskets were full in every house, there was more time to think about them, so that a sort of sickness came over the village, and people sat and did not speak nor ever laughed. In the spring, Kimke called the tribe together. He had been thinking, he said, during the winter and had decided that he would take a canoe and go to the east to a country which was there and which he had once been to when he was a boy. It lay many days across the sea, but he would go there and make a place for us. He would go alone because he could not spare more of our men for the voyage and he would return. The day that Kimki left was fair. We all went to the cove and watched him launch the big canoe. It held two baskets of water and enough tunas and dried abalone to last many days. We watched while Kimki paddled through the narrow opening in the rocks. Slowly he went through the kelp beds and into the sea. There he waved to us and we waved back. The rising sun made a silver trail across the water. Along this trail, he disappeared into the east. 
The rest of the day we talked about the journey. Would Kimke ever reach this far country about which nothing was known? Would he come back before the winter was over? Or never? That night we sat around the fire and talked while the wind blew and the waves crashed against the shore. After Kimki had been gone one moon, we began to watch for his return. Every day, someone went to the cliff to scan the sea. Even on stormy days we went, and on days when fog shrouded the island. During the day, there was always a watcher on the cliff, and each night as we sat around our fires, we wondered if the next sun would bring him home. But the spring came and left, and the sea was empty. Kimki did not return. There were few storms that winter, and rain was light and ended early. This meant that we would need to be careful of water. In the old days, the spring sometimes ran low, and no one worried. But now everything seemed to cause alarm. Many were afraid that we would die of thirst. There are other things more important to ponder, said Matasep, who had taken Kimki's place. Matasep meant the Aleuts, for it was now the time of year when they had come before. Watchers on the cliff began to look for the red sails, and a meeting was held to plan what to do if the Aleuts came. We lacked the men to keep them from landing or to save our lives if they attacked us, which we were certain they would. Plans were therefore made to flee as soon as their ship was sighted. Food and water were stored in canoes, and these were hidden on the rocks at the south end of the island. The cliffs were steep here and very high, but we wove a stout rope of bull kelp and fastened it to rocks at the top of the cliff so that it hung to the water. As soon as the Aleut ship was sighted, we would all go to the cliff and let ourselves down one at a time. We would then leave in our canoes for the island of Santa Catalina. Although the entrance to Coral Cove was too narrow for a ship to pass through safely at night, men were sent there to watch the cove from dusk to dawn, besides those who watched during the day. Shortly afterwards, on a night of fine moon, one of the men came running back to the village. Everyone was asleep, but his cries quickly awakened us. The Aleuts, he shouted, the Aleuts! It was news we expected. We were prepared for it, yet there was much fear in the village of Galasat. Matasep strode from hut to hut, telling everyone to be calm and not to lose time packing things that would not be needed. I took my skirt of yucca fiber, however, for I had spent many days making it, and it was very pretty, and also my otter cape. Quietly, we filed out of the village along the trail that led toward the place where our canoes were hidden. The moon was growing pale, and there was a faint light in the east, but a strong wind began to blow. We had gone no farther than half a league when we were overtaken by the man who had given the warning. He spoke to Matasep, but we all gathered around to listen to him. I went back to the cove after I gave the alarm, he said. When I got there, I could see the ship clearly. It is beyond the rocks that guard the harbor. It is a smaller ship than the one which belonged to the Aleuts. The sails are white instead of red. Could you see anyone? Matasep asked. No. It is not the same ship which was here last spring? No. Matasep was silent, pondering the news. Then he told us to go on to where the canoes were and wait for him, for he was going back. It was light now, and we went quickly over the dunes to the edge of the cliff and stood there while the sun rose. The wind grew cold, but fearing that those on the ship would see the smoke, we did not start a fire, though we had meal to cook for breakfast. Instead, we ate a small quantity of dried abalone, and afterwards my brother Ramo climbed over the cliff. No one had been down to the rocks since the canoes were hidden, so we did not know whether they were still safe or not. While he was gone, we saw a man running across the dunes. It was Nanko, carrying a message from Matasep. He was sweating in spite of the cold, and he stood trying to catch his breath. We all waited, urging him to talk, but his face was happy, and we knew that he brought good news. Speak, 
everyone said in a chorus. I, I have been running for more than a league, he said. I cannot talk. You are talking, someone said. Speak, Nanko, speak, cried many voices. Nanko was having fun with us. He threw out his chest and took a deep breath. He looked around at the circle of faces as if he did not understand why everyone was staring at him. The ship, he said at last, saying the word slowly, does not belong to our enemies, the Alots. There are white men on the ship, and they have come from that place where Kimki went when he left our island. Has Kimki returned? An old man broke in. No, but it is he who saw the white men and told them to come here. What do they look like? Ulap asked. Are there boys on the ship? Asked Ramo, who had come back with his mouth full of something. Everyone seemed to be talking at once. Nanko made his face stern, which was hard for him to do because his mouth had been cut in the battle with the Aleuts, and ever since it had always seemed to smile. He held up his hand for silence. The ship has come for one reason, he said, to take us away from Galsat. To what place? I asked. It was good news that the ship did not belong to the Aleuts, but where would the white men take us? I do not know to what place, he said. Kimki knows, and he has asked the white men to take us there. Saying no more, Nanko turned back and we followed him. We were fearful of where we were going, yet we were happy too. We took nothing with us when we thought we would have to flee, so there was much excitement as we packed our baskets. Nanko strode up and down outside the houses, urging us to hurry. The wind grows strong, he shouted. The ship will leave you. I filled two baskets with the things I wished to take. Three fine needles of whalebone, an awl for making holes, a good stone knife for scraping hides, two cooking pots, and a small box made from a shell with many earrings in it. Ulop had two boxes of earrings, for she was vainer than I, and when she put them into her baskets, she drew a thin mark with blue clay across her nose and cheekbones. The mark meant that she was unmarried. The ship leaves, shouted Nanko. If it goes, Ulop shouted back, it will come again after the storm. My sister was in love with Nanko, but she laughed at him. Other men will come to the island, she said. They will be far more handsome and brave than those who leave. You are all women of such ugliness that they will be afraid and soon go away. The wind blew in fierce gusts as we left the village, stinging our faces with sand. Ramo hopped along far in front with one of our baskets, but before long he ran back to say that he had forgotten his fishing spear. Nanko was standing on the cliff, motioning us to hurry, so I refused to let him go back for it. The ship was anchored outside the cove, and Nanko said that it could not come closer to the shore because of the high waves. They were beating against the rocks with a sound of thunder. The shore, as far as I could see, was rimmed with foam. Two boats were pulled up on the beach. Beside them stood four white men, and as we came down the trail, one of the men beckoned us to walk faster. He spoke to us in a language which we could not understand. The men of our tribe, except Nanko and Chief Matase, were already on the ship. My brother Ramo was there too, Nanko said. He had run on ahead after I had told him that he could not go back to the village for his spear. Nanko said that he had jumped into the first boat that left the cove. Matasape divided the women into two groups. Then the boats were pushed into the water, and while they bobbed about, we scrambled into them as best we could. The cove was partly sheltered from the wind, but as soon as we went through the passage between the rocks and into the sea, great waves struck us. There was much confusion. Spray flew. The white men shouted at each other. The boat pitched so wildly that in one breath you could see the ship, and in the next breath it had gone. Yet we came to it at last and somehow were able to climb onto the deck. The ship was large, many times the size of our biggest canoes. 
It had two tall masts, and between them stood a young man with blue eyes and a black beard. He was the chieftain of the white men, for he began to shout orders which they quickly obeyed. Sails rose on the tall masts, and two of the men began to pull on the rope that held the anchor. I called to my brother, knowing that he was very curious and therefore would be in the way of the men who were working. The wind drowned my voice, and he did not answer. The deck was so crowded that it was hard to move, but I went from one end of it to the other, calling his name. Still there was no answer. No one had seen him. At last I found Nanko. I was overcome with fear. Where's my brother? I cried. He repeated what he had told me on the beach, but as he spoke, Ulap, who stood beside him, pointed toward the island. I looked out across the deck in the sea. There, running along the cliff, the fishing spear held over his head was Ramo. The sails had filled, and the ship was now moving slowly away. Everyone was looking toward the cliff, even the white men. I ran to one of them and pointed, but he shook his head and turned from me. The ship began to move faster. Against my will, I screamed. Chief Matasape grasped my arm. We cannot wait for Ramo, he said. If we do, the ship will be driven on the rocks. We must, I shouted, we must. The ship will come back for him on another day, Matasape said. He will be safe. There is food for him to eat and water to drink and places to sleep. No, I cried. Matasape's face was like stone. He was not listening. I cried out once more, but my voice was lost in the howling wind. People gathered around me, saying again what Matasape had said, yet I was not comforted by their words. Ramo had disappeared from the cliff, and I knew that he was now running along the trail that led to the beach. The ship began to circle the kelp bed, and I thought surely that it was going to return to the shore. I held my breath, waiting. Then slowly its direction changed. It pointed toward the east. At that moment, I walked across the deck, and though many hands tried to hold me back, flung myself into the sea. A wave passed over my head, and I went down and down until I thought I would never behold the day again. The ship was far away when I rose. Only the sails showed through the spray. I was still clutching the basket that held all of my things. But it was very heavy, and I realized that I could not swim with it in my arms. Letting it sink, I started off toward the shore. I could barely see the two rocks that guarded the entrance to Coral Cove, but I was not fearful. Many times I had swum farther than this, although not in a storm. I kept thinking over and over as I swam how I would punish Ramo when I reached the shore. Yet when I felt the sand under my feet and saw him standing at the edge of the waves, holding his fishing spear and looking so forlorn, I forgot all those things I planned to do. Instead, I fell to my knees and put my arms around him. The ship had disappeared. When will it come back? Ramo asked. There were tears in his eyes. Soon, I said. The only thing that made me angry was that my beautiful skirt of yucca fibers, which I had worked on so long and carefully, was ruined. The wind blew strong as we climbed the trail, covering the mesa with sand that sifted around our legs and shut out the sky. Since it was not possible to find our way back, we took shelter among some rocks. We stayed there until night fell. Then the wind lessened and the moon came out, and by its light we reached the village. The huts looked like ghosts in the cold light. As we neared them, I heard a strange sound like that of running feet. I thought that it was a sound made by the wind, but when we came closer, I saw dozens of wild dogs scurrying around through the huts. They ran from us, snarling as they went. The pack must have slunk into the village soon after we left, for it had gorged itself upon the abalone we had not taken. It had gone everywhere searching out food, and Ramo and I had to look hard to find enough for our supper. 
While we ate beside a small fire, I could hear the dogs on the hill not far away, and through the night their howls came to me on the wind. But when the sun rose and I went out of the hut, the pack trotted off toward its lair, which was at the north side of the island in a large cave. That day we spent gathering food. The wind blew, and the waves crashed against the shore so that we could not go out on the rocks. I gathered gull eggs on the cliff, and Ramos speared a string of small fish in one of the tide pools. He brought them home walking proudly with the string over his back. He felt that in this way he had made up for the trouble he had caused. With the seeds I had gathered in a ravine, we had a plentiful meal, although I had to cook it on a flat rock. My bowls were at the bottom of the sea. The wild dogs came again that night. Drawn by the scent of fish, they sat on the hill, barking and growling at each other. I could see the light from the fire shining in their eyes. At dawn they left. The ocean was calm on this day, and we were able to hunt abalone among the rocks. From seaweed we wove a rough basket, which we filled before the sun was overhead. On the way home, carrying the abalone between us, Ramo and I stopped on the cliff. The air was clear, and we could look far out to sea in the direction the ship had gone. Will it come back today? Ramo asked. It may, I answered him, though I did not think so. More likely it will come after many suns, for the country where it has gone is far off. Ramo looked up at me. His black eyes shone. I do not care if the ship never comes, he said. Why do you say this, I asked him. Ramo thought, making a hole in the earth with the point of his spear. Why, I asked again. Because I like it here with you, he said. It is more fun than when the others were here. Tomorrow I am going to where the canoes are hidden and bring one back to Coral Cove. We will use it to fish in and to go looking around the island. They are too heavy for you to put into the water. You will see. Ramo threw out his chest. Around his neck was a string of sea elephant teeth, which someone had left behind. It was much too large for him, and the teeth were broken, but they rattled as he thrust the spear down between us. You forget that I am the son of Chawig, he said. I do not forget, I answered. But you are a small son. Someday you will be tall and strong, and then you will be able to handle a big canoe. I am the son of Chawik, he said again, and as he spoke, his eyes suddenly grew large. I am his son, and since he is dead, I have taken his place. I am now chief of Galasat. All my wishes must be obeyed. But first you must become a man." As is the custom, therefore, I will have to whip you with a switch of nettles and then tie you to a red anthill. Ramo grew pale. He had seen the rights of manhood given in our tribe and remembered them. Quickly, I said, since there are no men to give the rights, perhaps you will not have to undergo the nettles and the ants, Chief Ramo. I do not know if this name suits me, he said, smiling. He tossed his spear at a passing gull. I will think of something better. I watched him stride off to get the spear, a little boy with thin arms and legs like sticks, wearing a big string of sea elephant teeth. Now that he had become chief of Galasat, I would have even more trouble with him, but I wanted to run after him and take him in my arms. I have thought of a name, he said when he came back. What is it? I asked solemnly. I am chief... Tanyo Sitlope. That is a very long name and hard to say. You will soon learn, Chief Tanyo Sitlope said. I had no thought of letting Chief Tanyo Sitlope go alone to the place where the canoes were hidden, but the next morning when I awoke, I found that Ramo was not in the hut. He was not outside either, and I knew then that he had gotten up in the dark and left by himself. I was frightened. I thought of all that might befall him. He had climbed down the kelp rope once before, but he would have trouble pushing even the smallest of the canoes off the rocks. And if he did get one afloat without hurting himself, 
Would he be able to paddle around the sand spit where the tides ran fast? Thinking of these dangers, I started off to overtake him. I had not gone far along the trail before I began to wonder if I should not let him go to the cliff by himself. There was no way of telling when the ship would come back for us. Until it did, we were alone upon the island. Ramo, therefore, would have to become a man sooner than if we were not alone, since I would need his help in many ways. Suddenly I turned around and took the trail toward Coral Cove. If Ramo could put the canoe in the water and get through the tides that raced around the sand spit, he would reach the harbor when the sun was tall in the sky. I would be waiting on the beach, for what was the fun of a voyage if no one were there to greet him? I put Ramo out of my mind as I searched the rocks for mussels. I thought of the food we would need to gather and how best to protect it from the wild dogs when we were not in the village. I thought also of the ship. I tried to remember what Matasep had said to me. For the first time, I began to wonder if the ship would ever return. I wondered about this as I pried the shells off the rocks, and I would stop and look fearfully at the empty sea that stretched away farther than my eyes could reach. The sun moved higher. There was no sign of Ramo. I began to feel uneasy. The basket was filled, and I carried it up to the mesa. From here, I looked down on the harbor and farther on along the coast to the spit that thrust out like a fish hook into the ocean. I could see the small waves sliding up the sand and beyond them a curving line of foam where the currents raced. I waited on the mesa until the sun was overhead. Then I hurried back to the village, hoping that Ramo might have come back while I was gone. The hut was empty. Quickly, I dug a hole for the shellfish, rolled a heavy stone over the opening to protect them from the wild dogs, and started off toward the south part of the island. Two trails led there one on each side of a long sand dune. Ramo was not on the trail I was traveling, and thinking that he might be coming back out of sight along the other one, I called to him as I ran. I heard no answer, but did hear, far off, the barking of dogs. The barking grew louder as I came closer to the cliff. It would die away, and after a short silence, start up again. The sound came from the opposite side of the dunes, and leaving the trail, I climbed upward through the sand to its top. A short distance beyond the dune, near the cliff, I saw the pack of wild dogs. There were many of them, and they were moving around in a circle. In the middle of the circle was Ramo. He was lying on his back and had a deep wound in his throat. He lay very still. When I picked him up, I knew that he was dead. There were other wounds on his body from the teeth of the wild dogs. He had been dead a long time, and from his footsteps on the earth, I could see that he had never reached the cliff. Two dogs lay on the ground not far from him, and in the side of one of them was his broken spear. I carried Ramo back to the village, reaching it when the sun was far down. The dogs followed me all the way, but when I had laid him down in the hut and came out with a club in my hand, they trotted off to a low hill. A big gray dog with long curling hair and yellow eyes was their leader, and he went last. It was growing dark, but I followed them up the hill. Slowly they retreated in front of me, not making a sound. I followed them across two hills and a small valley to a third hill whose face was a ledge of rock. At one end of the ledge was a cave. One by one, the dogs went into it. The mouth of the cave was too wide and high to fill with rocks. I gathered brush and made a fire, thinking that I would push it back into the cave. Through the night, I would feed it and push it farther and farther back. But there was not enough brush for this. When the moon rose, I left the cave and went off through the valley and over the three hills to my home. All night, I sat there with the body of my brother and did not sleep. I vowed that someday I would go back and kill the wild dogs in the cave. I would kill all of them. I thought of how I would do it, but mostly I thought of Ramo, my brother. Chapter 2